Hello, I'm Murray Biggs. I suppose I've been some kind of Shakespearean most of my life, ever since a high school production of Hamlet, when the faculty director cast me as the villain. That's the only Shakespeare I've ever acted in, but I've spent most of my career directing and have directed 16 of Shakespeare's plays, three of them twice, mostly with student actors and including Twelfth Night. At the same time, though, I've always been a keen reader of Shakespeare, starting, as it happens, with Twelfth Night in, I think it must have been 11th grade, when I found a lot of the language quite hard to figure out. Some of it I still do and need to go back to the footnotes. But that's part of the fun of Shakespeare, having to go deeper into the meaning, especially the meaning that's hidden from us now because of the intervening centuries and the inevitable shifts of vocabulary and idiom. Shakespeare's writing life covered the last decade of the 16th century and the first decade of the 17th, plus a couple of years. In the 1590s, the playwright was mostly occupied with his English history plays and the comedies, which culminated in a sweep of inspiration at the end of the decade with the threesome that nowadays we generally recognize as Shakespeare's mature comedies. Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, and Twelfth Night. And for me, Twelfth Night is the pick of the bunch. Now, there's a problem with Shakespeare's comedies that doesn't really apply to the histories or tragedies. A history play about, say, Richard III sort of makes sense to us now because we can see that political struggles at the top of the social ladder haven't really changed. And the same can be said of tragedies like Julius Caesar. But Shakespeare's comedies are much less realistic. They're mostly romantic, what film and TV have taught us to call rom-coms. And we know, more's the pity perhaps, that in real life things don't always work out that way, especially that happy ending, none of which seems to affect our enjoyment of an unlikely story. The story of Twelfth Night has a couple of other twists that may take it even further from everyday experience. The first is the device of long lost and assumed dead family members who amazingly show up at the final act and da da are reunited. This plot device goes back to ancient times, but Shakespeare was never shy about using any story that had been shown to work. And in this case, he added another old trick, making the long lost family members twins. And not just in Twelfth Night either. Perhaps he was influenced by the fact that two of his three children, a boy and a girl, were also twins. Hence Viola and Sebastian here. But Shakespeare's use of old theatrical gags didn't end there. He did what his classical predecessors had also done and used the look-alike siblings to set up a whole pattern of mistaken identity. That in turn gathered conviction from the obligatory casting of boy actors with unchanged voices in all the female roles in the public theatres of the day. Even beyond that, the plots of some of these plays required the boys who were playing women to dress up as boys, usually for safety reasons. So the boy actor playing the young woman Viola disguises herself or himself as the male page Cesario and so can easily be mistaken for her twin brother Sebastian as well as innocently infatuating the Lady Olivia. At the same time, the viola underneath it all has fallen for her employer, Orsino. All very confusing, but all part of what drives the play's main plot. But, 
as almost always with Shakespeare, there's another plot moving alongside this one. And in the romantic comedies, this apparently minor plot is much more realistic. The difference between the two is marked by the fact that the so-called main plot is always written in verse and the subplot mostly in prose, which in this instance takes up 60% of the text. Prose makes the dialogue and the situation generally more natural and down to earth. This is where we meet a host of more obviously comic characters who are usually lower class. At least they're not dukes and heiresses, but it's significant that in Twelfth Night, two of these more everyday characters are actually gentry. Sir Andrew Aguecheek and Sir Toby Belch. And Sir Toby is given more lines than anyone else in the play. So he has central importance. So what we can say about this pair is that Andrew has come down in the world and Toby is knowingly slumming it. But the central character in this group is, of course, Malvolio, who's desperately trying to rise in the world. And that's his misfortune, since he eventually gets a rather cruel comeuppance. That happens only at the end of the play, where, as in the other comedies of this kind, the two plots come together and are resolved. Or not. That's up to you.